Hello, I'm Peter Duckworth. Welcome to my channel of traditional hymns set to the piano. People have asked, would I share a few tips about how I do this? Do I have music? Do I make it up? What do I do? A book that I use quite a lot is the Anglican Hymnal. One I quite like is number 225, Come Thou Holy Spirit Come. And of course, as we're heading for Pentecost now, this is a good hymn to choose. It's a hymn that's, uh, that goes back many hundreds of years. There's a question mark, and then it says Stephen Langton, who lived about 1160 to 1228. Stephen Langton was a very famous bishop. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury, after Thomas a Becket, and he was elected by the church and appointed by the Pope, but King John didn't like it and tried to revoke the appointment. There was a lot of furore about that. And eventually, his appointment was confirmed. Bishop Stephen Langton was present at Runnymede at the signing of the Magna Carta, and he helped to negotiate between the king's side and the barons. Anyway, this is a great hymn, and knowing its history, I think we need to play it with due dignity. So I'm going to play it as it's written, and then we'll take it to bits and see what we can do to it. Here is how it is harmonised. Quite nice harmonies. They vary a lot. They move surprisingly from one key to another. And we'd like to preserve as much of that as possible in our rendition of it. It's impossible to play something like this without meditating on the words. And so let's just read the first verse. Come thou Holy Spirit come, and from thy celestial home shed a ray of light divine. Come thou Father of the poor, come thou source of all our store, Come within our bosoms shine. And the second verse is good too. Thou of comforters the best, thou the soul's most welcome guest. Sweet refreshment here below. In our labour, rest most sweet. Grateful coolness in the heat. Solace in the midst of woe. I think it's good to reflect on the words as we play any hymn because that influences the way we play it. But let's uh, let's see. Let's take this apart and see how we do it. Let's, here's the first line. That's music written for four parts, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And so it's got four parts. And then the, the parts move like this. But on the piano, we're not limited to four parts. We have a whole piano at our disposal. It's like an orchestra. I, I'm free to do uh, arrangements of it as I wish. And I, I would, first thing I would do is put some octaves in the left hand, so like this. in the first verse but as we expand the musical concept through verses two onwards we want to beef it out a little bit to add some some extra weight next thing I want to talk about is the tune the melody line it's important to have a singing melody line the whole purpose of any musical instrument is to sound like the human voice the human voice is the most beautiful of all instruments and the piano is aiming to be like the human voice so what you want to try and do in your mind is to sing the part, or to feel it singing to you, if you like. So let me just play that part by itself. What we're doing there is introducing a little bit of phrasing 
and rising and fall of the dynamic. So rising and then falling. Definite. Falling. That's a lovely line. It just three lines together make a perfect sort of musical phrase really. But then it takes off in a new direction, which is quite exciting. It's gone here from F major, which is written, to B flat major. And then it modulates back into the tonic again. That is a very satisfying musical journey. Playing the tune musically, we need to pick out the melody line above the rest of the voices so that it sounds clearly. See, so yeah, I'm making that melody line sing a little bit, and so just keep the, the listener very interested in what's going on with the music. Now, another thing I want to talk about is phrasing. I've talked about the musical phrase, which is the, the way you play a line of music in a musical way. But there's also, it's important to have breaths, particularly where you have singers. Now, between the first and the second and the third line, there are gaps that we need to bring out on the keyboard. to be a little bit discreet. You don't want to mush it all up like oh, horrible, horrible clashes of notes. But it's it's an aid to get around the piano so that you don't in case you have stretches that you might leave ugly gaps. And then off for the next you can see that already I'm changing some of the harmonies and that's because I just prefer to do what I feels right at the moment. But if I, if I had a choir singing, I'd need to stick more closely to the notes. This is only something you do if you're leading the congregation and they don't have the music in front of them. thing is to make the music sing. Every part has got to sing and the best way to do that is to live it yourself, to feel you're entering into the hymn, to look at the words, to feel the sense of worship, the sense of history. We're talking about a church that existed halfway between the time of Christ and now. Of course the church has gone through many ups and downs in its history but it's lovely that in the, min in the Middle Ages, right at the time of King John, Beautiful stuff like this was written. I'm talking about the words rather than the music. The music came later. It sounds a little bit like chant, to be honest. It could have been sung in a cathedral, something like this, but probably just simple lines. A plain song like that, not the, not the full harmony that we have now. That, that's an understanding that came later with J.S. Bach, I think it's fair to say. The understanding of harmony and how, how this now has become part of Western music. It's a very great gift of Western music to the world, so let's not um, waste it, let's make the most of the harmonies. But there's various alternative harmonies you can use, as I said. So, although this is written... I might choose to do that slightly different, like this. doing there 
there was simply slipping in another C chord. There. Now that's a little simplification of the music, which is... But you can, you can pick and choose whatever feels right when you're playing it, I think. note here. There's some there's a sense of real building up to that last line and when you come to the last line you can give it a bit of welly. Just then, I was echoing the final chord by a softer chord in the right hand. And these are little kind of ornaments you can add on if you want to. The more you get confident, the more you increase your repertoire, the easier it is to do. piano technique. What is piano technique and how does it help playing hymns? Well, you all know about scales and if we were preparing for this hymn we might do a little bit of rehearsing of the key of F major. scales is it makes you confident on the notes instead of being hesitant about whether you're pressing that note you press each one firmly but I also use and a lot of musicians use the Hanon virtuoso pianist these are exercises designed to strengthen particularly your outer fingers because they're the weakest like this It's quite useful having the right hand and the left hand doing the same notes because you're playing different fingers in each hand uh, but you, and so you have to be concentrating. What they say is you articulate the notes very clearly. You lift your fingers high before striking the notes. So I can get in my fingers the more expression I can put into a piece because the essence of expression is being able to strike notes with different degrees of force. Now as you get good you can you get faster and faster. So. And so on. I recommend the Hanon exercises. They're really used by pretty well all pianists. 15 or 20 minutes of this loosens your fingers up tremendously so you can then play some good stuff. Just play one last time. video and I uh, look forward to seeing you again on another occasion.